Okay, welcome everybody. We are in John, the fourth chapter. We are going to be reading 27 to the end of the verse, our uh, end of the chapter. Uh, Mandy Lay is going to start us off. I want to thank you for popping in either on the Facebook or in live. If you'd like to join us, uh, you can request the link at PastorTimNelson at gmail.com. Mandy Lay, start us off. Okay, verse 27. Just then his disciples arrived and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into town and told the people, come see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? Verse 34, Jesus said to, him, said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and the other reaps. I sent to you to reap that for which you have not labored, others have labor, labored, and you have entered into their labors. Verse 39. Amen. 39. <clears throat> Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, and he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his word, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Amen. Verse 43. Now after two days, he departed hence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then when he had, was coming to Galilee, the Galilean received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast. 46. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked, him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Auntie Helene's, but she's not here yet. So I guess I'll do that. Um, 51 to 54. And he was now going down. As he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he believed himself and his whole family with him. This, again, is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Hmm. All right, we'll give you all a few moments to look over your section. Uh, glean from it what the Spirit has led you to um, see, and then share it with the rest of us. When you're ready, just give a little hands up on your screen. Mandy's ready. 
Mat is ready. Hati Helene is ready. Jeremiah, are you ready? He's ready. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You can lower your hand and go back to your position. <laughs> All right. Let's begin. I believe Auntie Joyce is ready. So, Mandy Lee, star song. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was waiting for Auntie Joyce to respond. But, uh, <laughs> well, the first thing that I noticed is that um, uh, you can see how Jesus changes people because of the question that the disciples had not asked, I guess, mm. when they return. Um, first off, you know, they believe that rabbis shouldn't talk to women and they didn't ask Jesus like, oh, why are you talking to this woman? And or um, what is it you want, woman? Like they didn't ask those questions, you know, and, and to them, I think it's that they've been around him for quite some time that I think nothing is shocking them anymore. <laughs> Mm. quite you know and and it's kind of like within that verse it kind of like reminds me that you know you've been um Jesus has been in your life so long no matter what you go through it shouldn't shock you when those blessings come mm. like <laughs> you shouldn't be shocked and so um but my favorite part of this is how she she left she left not ashamed. She left excited. She left in a hurry um, to go and tell people, um, you know, she came to that well with empty jars and she left filled and overflowing with the living water. You know, and she wanted to share that. And we're going to see the ripple effect happening. Like she's just one small little pebble thrown into that town and now the ripple effect is going to happen and you know the way the the hurry that she left Jesus she was also in a hurry to bring people back to Jesus so amen that should be us you amen. know we shouldn't yeah thank you <laughs> continue please awesome <laughs> no, I, I was just thinking of of moments when um, the Holy Spirit maybe puts somebody on your mind to reach out and and sometimes we're like, well, I'll get to that later, you know, and later might be the wrong time, you know, and we should do things when we're when things are put onto our heart. Um like be obedient right away and that's what she shows me like she was obedient right away he didn't have to tell her she just knew that he needed to go and reach other people for jesus so yes all right monty okay verse 34 um my food is to do the will of the him who sent me if you want to know why Jesus does anything, it's this verse. And uh, this verse tells us why Jesus does what he does. Just like we need food for physical sustenance, Jesus is sustained by his Father in heaven. Mm. When, when, people, when, when Jesus tells people not to tell anyone about miracles or says that it's not the right time, it's because... He is focused on doing God's will. And uh, in the spiritual realm, Jesus is living water. When, when we thirst for a spiritual nourishment, we can look to Jesus and find what we need. And just like Jesus looked to his father for sustenance, we too can look to God for spiritual sustenance. And the idea of a harvest usually means there are there is a lot of food in abundance. And so this idea of a harvest also relates to the end of time when there will be uh, an abundance of good things. So now when Jesus talks about the harvest, he's saying that there is a lot of work to do to gather in, in all of the crops. 
but he's also saying that the work needs to be done quickly because the harvest is ready now. So what Jesus is saying is that we need to be urgent in doing God's work. We, we can't wait around or be lazy because there's a lot of work to be done and it needs to be done now. But I thought about that. Would, doesn't that mean works? That salvation comes from faith alone and not from our own efforts or actions? This, this is a key teaching in the Christian faith. And it's rooted in the idea that we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. However, it's also important to understand the context. Who is this book of John about? Jesus. So Jesus is, the met Jesus is using the metaphor of the harvest to emphasize the urgency and importance of sharing the gospel message with others. In other words, while our salvation ultimately comes from our faith in Jesus, each one of us also has a responsibility to share that faith with others and to do the work of spreading God's love and message throughout the world. This work is urgent and important. And Jesus is, is reminding us of that passage. Jesus will, okay, and Pastor Tim, you'll recognize this. I, I totally got it from, from our conversation that we had about the investigative judgment. Jesus will claim his kingdom one relationship at a time. So while it's, while it's true that, the, that salvation is from faith alone, we should also remember that our faith should lead us into action so that the harvest metaphor is a reminder of the urgency and importance think of, think of a relay race you know where a team of runners pass a baton to each other have 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 you guys ever done a relay race have you ever run that so in in, in that in a relay race the first runner might start off strong but then the second and third runners might struggle a bit. However, the, the fourth runner might have a burst of energy and end up winning a race for the team. And that's why we always put the, the, the fast runners either in the beginning or the end. Like, uh, did you, were, were you one of the fast runners, Tim? All depends on your definition of fast. <laughs> okay, so so similarly in John 47, Jesus is saying that it's not always the person who first tells someone about salvation who ends up bringing them others to belief. Sometimes, sometimes it, it, it might be someone else who comes along and helps the person to fully understand and accept the message of salvation. But no matter who helps the person, it's ultimately God who deserves the credit for their faith. So just like a relay race, the different runners on the team all contribute to the overall success of the race, even if one runner is the one who comes across to the finish line. So in the same way, different people might contribute to someone's journey of faith, but ultimately it's God who, bring, who brings the, the person to belief. And this final verse, the disciples were benefiting from the work of those who came before them, such as the prophets and messengers. It reminds us to, to be grateful for spiritual blessings we receive and to work together with others to spread the gospel message. It also highlights the importance of, of patience and perseverance in God's in doing God's work. And that's what I have for those Four verses. That was a great job. Great job, Monty. Thank you very much. Amen. Good other thing. Um, Auntie Herbie. Okay. I will piggyback on what. Oh. Hold on, Auntie Herbie, real fast. Auntie yes. Helene, you have verses um, 51 to 54. So if you could, when we get to your uh, there, that section, um, if you could explain those to us. Thank you. Go ahead, Auntie Herbie. 
Yeah, I, I'm going to piggyback on what Mandy and um, <clears throat> Monty had just said on their part. And that is that we all have a purpose, you know, and that is to share the kingdom of God. And that's our purpose here on this, in this world. I think about this woman who, like I said last last, last some studies was that she felt, you know, she was broken, she was lost, she was lonely. And, um, and what she did, Pastor, she went out to share the gospel with, I think she became the most, um, she became the biggest evangelist, I think, for the women, women in the world, in our world, because her story is still moving on. It's still going, you know? Here it is with us today. And she's from way back then with Jesus. And her story is still going. And so I see her as an evangelist, you know, sharing her, her Jesus with, with all of us, you know. And, and, the, and the many people who came to see Jesus was because of her, you know. And he stayed there with them for two days, two extra days with the Samaritans, sharing, you know, sharing them, sharing to them about the kingdom of God. That's what Christ was doing. And this lady was so amazing, you know. So I think, you know, sometimes with me, you know, I, I have a hard time also trying to share, you know. Uh, you know, I think, I, and I'm thinking, uh, maybe my gift is just praying. You know, when I pray, that's sharing, you know, God's love. So I'm not good at sharing the gospel, but I'm good at praying for people. So I think that's where my gift is as an evangelist. <laughs> that's what I want to say. So, you know, my reflection is I want to share is with all, all of us, we all have that privilege, you know, to introduce someone to someone who's sitting at the well and his name is Jesus. Amen. Great, great job, Auntie. I want to just interject right here. Um, and just so what you said about, you know, not knowing, you know, what you can do to share. Um, the lady had some knowledge of theology and, you know, um, religiosity, um, you know, the debates about who's on the mountain and, or we are where we worship and all this kind of stuff. Um, but it wasn't that that convinced the people, right? Um, she went back and what did she tell the people? We're going to get to this in, um, I think, um, Jeremiah section. But what did she tell the people? She said, come and see the man who told me everything I did. About herself. Come and see the man knows everything who about I her. was. Mm -hmm. Who knows, you know, all the stuff that you guys whisper in the background and you snicker about me and stuff like that he knew and he accepted me and that was one thing they could have said oh it's just another man trying to get you know lucky with you um but there was something different something about her expression about the joy that she had gave them hope gave them curiosity wanted gave them the the, the um desire to come and see what she had found to change her demeanor in that way. We don't need to have a lot of Bible knowledge. We don't need to have a lot of uh, debating skills. We don't even need to have a great um, story about you know where we came from. What we have to have is an encounter with Jesus that changes us and then tell somebody about that with the joy that we have with that change. You know, People are fascinated by people who have been changed by the presence of Jesus. When they see a person who's legitimately been changed, it doesn't matter how much they know, it's who they know. And so, Auntie, I'll tell you, you are one of the best evangelists we have based on your smile and your generosity and your peace. All you gotta do is tell people, Jesus, Jesus, that's it. He changed me. I once was this way and now I'm this way. And the thing in the middle was Jesus. Amen. That's Amen. the great testimony that we have. Still that from Dallas Jenkins. That was a nice quote. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. 
Guys, just wanted to interject there and make sure that we know that we're all evangelists, mm -hmm. regardless of what we have, if we've met Jesus and had an encounter with him. Um, Auntie Joyce. It says in, in verse 43, now after two days, he departed. You know, what happened within those two days? I, I'm, I'm, when we were talking, when you were describing um, some of the things that was happening with her and uh, how God, Jesus knew exactly what she would, had done, her past. I'm, I'm all, also wondering, she went back and she had told the people and the curiosity of a lot of people were there. I, and I'm sure that her testimony of what had happened to her was so real um, that the people there wanted to know more and more. And, and that fits into to the, the Lord's love and kindness of what he was giving out. And the people wanted that. I, I, I kind of feel that way. Um, and that um, he, when he came to Galilee, they, they received him. They received him because they were there before. They heard the news. They heard someone saying to them that this Lord knows all, this God, this Christ knows all. Um, and she was able to, to display that to others and they wanted to know more. And it just seems that, God, that Jesus took those two extra days just for them, just for them. Um, and, you know, it kind of reminds me of, of times when we, when we struggle, you know, those extra days that, that we, we walk and we talk with the Lord is so precious because we're struggling, you know, we're, we're doing things that, and, and, and the Lord just, takes the time with us, just takes all the time that we need with us. His love is enduring. His love is perfect. Um, and that's it. And, you know, I, I, maybe, Pastor, you can um, uh, elaborate on verse 44 uh, later on, and you can explain that a little bit more. Um, but um, it just seems that the... My verses, it just gives more of God's love and what he is so patient and what he knows about us. And he knows everything. Amen. Amen. All right. So this story, I think, is pretty cool. New story. Um, but we go back to the place that uh, Jesus turned the water into wine, to Cana. And I think this is a really important detail because that means in this town, people know, or at the very least have were there when Jesus turned the water into wine. So they know who Jesus is. So there's this official, this Roman official who's heard that Jesus is coming. And he asked Jesus to, to heal him. It's like his last resort because his son was about to die and probably he tried all the doctors and, and like, like nothing worked on none of the natural remedies, none of the medicine, nothing worked. And so he felt like this man that he had heard about was probably going to be his last resort. But Jesus response to him, I think is very indicative of how he was thinking because when he asked Jesus for help, he says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So Jesus knows that this, this Roman official, he isn't going to believe that Jesus really is the Messiah unless his son is healed. So that's his thought process. He's like, okay, so this is my last resort. There's this man who people claim to, to perform miracles. If he heals my son, then I will believe in him. But Jesus knows, and he says, unless you see signs you guys won't believe and the man realizes that jesus read his heart and he just like jesus like please come down like my child is going to die and jesus instead of actually usually i feel like 
Jesus listens fairly well to people's requests, like um, like Jairus, for instance, right? Jairus asked Jesus to come to his house to heal his daughter, and Jesus goes, right? In this instance, Jesus doesn't listen. He doesn't come down. He says, go, your son will live. And I think immediately he's putting this man to the test. Like, he knows why you, you came here because you wanted to see a sign in order to believe. But I'm giving you an opportunity to believe right now without even seeing the sign. Like, you've heard about what I'm capable of doing. So just go. Go back home. You don't need me to come. Your son will live. And so the man is left with the choice. Do I continue to beg Jesus to come to my house or just give up? Or do I listen to him and just believe that my son is okay now? Mm -hmm. The Bible says that the man believed what Jesus said to him and he went back home. So for us, it's, I talked to the pastor about this, about asking for signs if it's okay, like, like Gideon asked for signs. And even Moses, God gave him signs to know. Um, but like Jesus says to Thomas, right? Because you have seen, you believe, blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. And I think that like the, the official, like who just heard the reports of what Jesus had done, like we too have all these reports from the word of God and even from our own testimonies, like from other people's testimonies, right, of what Jesus is capable of doing. And yet sometimes, at least I feel like there are, there are moments where I feel like I want God to actually do something like give me an actual sign before I believe when I know that he has worked in other people's lives and like really crazy ways and, and ways that are similar to mine, but because of my stubbornness, like, like we're just, we're, we're very logical beings, right? We we're very realistic, logical beings. So we don't, don't really want to believe in something we don't think is possible, but that's mm -hmm. what Jesus is calling us to do that's what jesus calls this man to do to to believe my word simply believe my word and you'll see my power so that's what i got from this section good job Gemma. and healing okay yeah i'm um, sorry i was late i was detained <laughs> but i'm here um yeah so anyway i want to ask you know like um Mandy, Monty, Jeremiah, Pastor Herbie, Auntie Joyce, um, where's our faith? Where's our faith? You know, and so I think in my chapter, I think these verses that I read, you know, they're very, um, very faith strong verses because they're all about believing. So here, a boy lives because of belief, because of faith, and the boy is healed, but more than that, it's not just the fact that he's alive and he's well, but who the healer is, the one who healed, which is Christ. So this story is about him, but then here we have not just the child being, being healed, but the whole family being saved, you know, because of faith. So this is like, um, again, in the, the wine and, and water being turned into water that Jesus is turning water into wine. It's that, that, that simple and that so, so seems so in, instant, instant, because faith is that way too. Um, it's like, um, oh, I, I need more faith. Oh God, I need more faith. Do I really need more faith or do I just need faith to believe? So I think that's part of my problem in walking is that, you know, sometimes I tell myself, gosh, I need more faith. I need more faith. I need more faith. No, I don't. I already have faith. I need to just believe that that's all I need to walk. Right? So this is, um, this story is not only about the boy being perfect. Um, you know, the fact that they're safe, but his, his whole family. And when you think about that hour and the time that, he was saved, 
they're looking back at, you know, again, time the hour, the seventh hour. So, and seven being so very, very perfect as we all know it. So um, I think, um, you know, again, this to me reflecting back on faith here in my, in my, in my few verses. So praise God. Amen. Great job. Great job, Auntie. Great job, all of you. Uh, I'm going to open it up to all of you who you guys have a few things, and then I'll close up. I believe Mandy has one. Mm -hmm. And then Monty. Okay. So um, I kind of noticed there's, I, John just has patterns going on through all his books so far, you know? And what I see is like, um, everyone hears and then they see there's that hear and see throughout his and and even in revelations it's like mm -hmm. that too like he hears and then he sees you know mm -hmm. he hears a message and then he sees and and a lot of the times it's um you know there there's so much things that john and i are going through right now and you know we know we know who our God is. Amen. But sometimes it's just like, Lord, just let us see. Like, let us see. Like, we hear you. You know, we hear what you're saying. We were reading it. It's like, like, when is it that we're going to to see, to see it, you know? And and we just like Auntie said, just believe, you know, because you know that he is a good God, you know, he's a good father. You know, he, he's taken care of people from day one of creating this earth, you know, and he's going to take care of you. And um, uh, that's just like what gets myself and what gets John through the crisis that we face <laughs> every time, <laughs> you know, and um, but you notice that it starts with living water and um, what is it called? Water and thirst and food and hunger, you know, and he is the one that quenches your dry spells, I guess, if you have your dry season. And he is the one that's going to give you the substance when you're hungry for something, you know, and um and a lot of the times is we just have to accept that living water and we have to submit to his will and not our will. So. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Good job, sis. Um, Monty. Yeah, I wanted to re reply to Auntie Joyce. Uh, um, people are often more willing to accept new ideas or perspectives from outsiders. You guys ever notice that? Like my wife, she's she's with me all the time. So if I come up with this great out of the box idea, she'll say, there you go again, Monty, boundaries. <laughs> but if it's Isaac or my other son, Christopher, and they come home, uh, <laughs> they come up with this great idea. Jenny will say, see, Monty, now that's my son. You know, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you ever notice that that people would rather listen to somebody um they're more open to hear it from somebody on the outside so like in in the context of this gospel message where it says a prophet uh a, a, a prophet has no honor in his own country uh the, it reminds us of the importance of being open right to new new ideas and perspectives even if they come from people uh we know or are familiar with and um and um I, i'm trying to think how how best to say that so like there's a challenge um uh that can arise when we when we share the gospel message with those who are close to us or from our own community um and ultimately it's a reminder that the gospel message is most effective when it comes from unexpected sources or from people outside our immediate circle. And um, I think I think we're called to be open to new ideas and to share 
the good news of Jesus Christ with everyone, regardless of their background or familiarity with us. And it's it every time I'm I, I I've been trying to do this more often. I don't know if you guys have been, but like at work or just with strangers, whenever the door is open, uh, someone says something about uh, about uh, that can just open the door uh, about you talking of about the Bible or Jesus or God. Um, you should you should jump on that so that you can have that discussion. Is that it, Martin? Yeah. That... Excellent, excellent, excellent. And you are absolutely right. Uh, every encounter is an opportunity. Just throw a couple of ideas I got through all of your brilliant um, discussion and analysis. Um, the disciples marveled that I talked to a woman. Uh, Mandy hit on this a little bit. I just want to run through it. It was inappropriate in society's eyes for him to talk to a woman. Uh, being a rabbi, her being a Samaritan, her being a woman of ill repute, um, both of them being, uh, at least him being single, uh, her without a man there present, a um, thousand reasons. But here's the thing I love about Jesus. He lowers his status to save us. Amen. You know, this is a, um, a microcosm of what he did in salvation, coming down from heaven to dwell with sinners, dwell with you know us, uh, us on earth. Um, it shows, Jesus shows in this that culture and cultural thoughts and norms and traditional thoughts and norms have nothing to do with salvation, and we should um, not let them get in the way. I've heard, I can't tell you how many times I've heard in my 40 years in Hawaii, well, you know, that's, that, 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 that's not how our culture does it. And I'm like, it doesn't matter what your culture does. It matters what Jesus did. And people will justify bad behavior through culture, treating others poorly. Well, you know, Samoans and Tongans, we don't get along. Or, you know, this group and this group, we don't get along. And it's, 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 it's you know, what Jesus does, he cut through all of that and says, this is a child of God, and this is what matters. And he did that with this Samaritan woman. Uh, by talking to her, he was showing quality. Okay, He's reasoning with her the way uh, he would reason with another rabbi or another scholar. You, you see that? You know, she's bringing up all these questions. And he could justifiably in his culture have said, uh, this is beyond your pay grade, okay? Stick to your lane. Okay, shut up and dribble. You don't know what you're talking about. But instead, he talks with her. Now, he leads her to a deeper knowledge and a deeper wisdom, but he still talks with her. It's a marvel to them how he could lower himself to talk to this person. And he converses with us in all of our foolishness and all of our questioning and all of our trying to like prove how sometimes smart we are and how theological we are. He puts up with it, and but he leads us to a deeper knowledge. And at the end of it, what does she do? She leaves her jar, her purpose for being there, the purpose that she had in that day. I was thirsty. I had desire for water. And she leaves that behind in order to go tell people what this Jesus has done for her. It was a maybe 20 minute, if that. You know, if you just read this, it was five minutes. But say, you know, give it that. It was a very brief encounter, but it changes everything. And her purpose changes and she goes from being someone who is seeking to fulfill her desires and her wants to someone who is seeking to tell yeah. others about Jesus and give them the water that she's been given. She goes from being an empty vessel to a flowing spigot or a deep well, depending on you know how you look at it. Yeah. Um, she goes in and says, come and see. Uh, this is the call of the evangelist. Come and see. You have to see for yourself. She realizes that it has to be a personal uh, journey. So she invites everyone to have a personal journey. And as I said with Auntie earlier, it was the, um, the, the change they saw in her that gave them the desire to go see it. But she's come and see, could this man be the Messiah? After two days of spending with her, it says, now we have seen. And he is not only the Messiah, not only the Christ, but he is the Savior of the world. They get it before his own people do. Mandy talked a little about juxtapositions. Here's one of them. He's rejected in his homeland, okay, in his, his birth town, okay, this town he grew up in. 
He's accepted, though. Before he's accepted by any Jew, he's accepted by an entire town of Samaritans because now we have seen. And how is he accepted? Because they all had a personal experience with him. Salvation has to be a personal experience. Yeah. Okay? It's not going to come through a book that someone reads or a seminar that someone goes to, although we want people to go to these things. All these things, books and seminars and sermons, are one person saying to another person, Come and see for yourself. And it's an opportunity to engage in and have a deeper personal walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, she was very successful because the entire town went out to her. Oh, one of you said she was one of the most successful evangelists of all time. That's true. Uh, she was. Our story is still being talked about. Um, disciples came. And again, here's this duality. They're coming here. And notice that they are falling into the same mentality that the woman had. The woman said, how will you draw from this world? You have no thing to draw with, you know? And, you know, she was seeing things on the physical level. And he brought her the ability to see things on the spiritual level. Now the disciples come and they're like, what's the food that he has? Did someone give him food? And when he says, I have food that you know not of, again, they're not seeing it. She has actually advanced and surpassed them in their ability, her ability to understand scriptures mm -hmm. and and the purpose of jesus christ in that moment because she now sees things uh beyond she sees the spiritual above the physical and they haven't quite got there yet i think it's just fascinating what john reveals to this woman uh, he says open your eyes the harvest um harvest came in through them expanding their horizons um showed them that if they would just stop looking at the harvest has to look like this. They thought the harvest could only be the Jews. And he said, no, open your eyes. The entire world is ready <clears throat> to be harvested. You need to go out now and do the thing that you need to do. Monty had a wonderful exposition on that. I'm not going to go over it all. But here's the thing. All of us play a part in the salvific process. God made it that way. He didn't have to, but he made it that way. So you don't have to do a lot. You don't have to do it all. But what you have to do is your part, not so that you're saved, but because you're saved. You have the experience of Jesus. Now our part is to go and tell them, come and see. That's our part. That's why we're all here. Uh, gaining more knowledge from the Bible, not so that we can be smarter, but so that we can be better equipped to tell people to come and see Jesus. Um. Yeah, each person must have their own personalized experience. Um, healing of the nobleman's son. Uh, this is fascinating. Uh, the, the woman runs out, the Samaritan woman runs out and says, hey, come and see. I've seen this thing. She tells them. And they say, all right, we'll go see. They believe and they walk out on faith based on her word. John starts off his gospel. It says, in the beginning was the word. Okay, it was the thing that we heard. And the word is with God, and the word was God, and through him was everything created, and without him was nothing created. Okay, it's by hearing. It's this hearing thing. Okay, the nobleman comes and says, please come, my son's dying, come heal him. And all the town says, yeah, we want to go see this thing. And Jesus Christ sees him, and notice he doesn't say to the man, he doesn't say, unless you see. He says, unless you people, talking to the town, see this thing, you'll never believe. I've already done enough to give you proof. But so it doesn't leave the man... Um, empty. He says, go, your son will be healed, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the man had his way of thinking of how Jesus was going to do this miracle. He told him, come with me and do this miracle so I can do it. I got to close up at uh, 59. But he, he, he wanted Jesus to, to, to perform the miracle in the way in which he saw it. But Jesus said, no, I'm going to perform it in the way that I see it. And you're not going to be able to even see me doing the thing. You're just going to have to trust. And so the man goes, and I want to tell you, the longest walk in the Christian journey is the walk between leaving the face of Jesus, okay? When, when you're, 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 you hear the voice of Jesus saying, just trust me, and then seeing the results, okay? The entire way he's walking, he says, I believe, Jesus say, do it, I have to believe, but man, last time I saw him, he was sick, last time I saw him, he was lost, last time I saw him, he was in the club, last time I saw him, he was moving out of the house, last time I saw him, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? I can't. I haven't seen the change yet. How many of you are walking in that, that walk where you haven't seen the change yet, but you've heard the voice of God say the change has happened? Maybe mm -hmm. it's in your own life. Maybe it's in the life of someone you love. Hold on to the faith that Jesus has given you, okay? Because it's by your faith that 
that the change happens. And then what does it say? He meets the people and says, Yeah, your son, he's got it's gotten better. He's healed. He says, when, when did he get healed? And he tells him the time. He says, At this time, he began to get better. Okay. He began to get better. Sometimes miracles come in progress. You know, trust in the progress. You know, sometimes we're like, Lord, I need money to pay the rent. And we look down, there's a five dollar bill. We're like, I got to pay the rent. No, but it's a deposit on the faith that you have. Use it in good faith. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes God will give you not enough that the, the enough that you think you need, but just enough for the, you to continue walking on in faith. Trust mm -hmm. in the trust in that. Mm -hmm. Trust in that. Trust in the little bit He gives you uh, that it's enough. Trust that the, the the fullness of His promise has already been fulfilled, and what you're now getting is the progress. Um. Yep, he wanted Jesus changed the perspective of the man. Uh, he wanted to control Jesus, but after meeting Jesus, he let Jesus be in control. That's the walk of the follower, you know. Uh, and the question I have for us as we finish this is: Will you walk in faith without seeing the answer to your prayer? Amen. I hope you do. Guys, I want to thank you so much for being a part of this. We have a board meeting following this. And so I'm going to, uh, we're going to say a prayer. And then uh, those of you who are not on the board, you can, I uh, will see you next time. I want to thank you so much. I hope that you join us coming up uh, this Sabbath. And those of you who are online, if you uh, want to join us this Sabbath, we're starting a seminar. Uh, come and see. And it is uh, about revealing the character of Christ and walking in him. And uh, it's going to be fascinating. Uh, it's going to be fascinating. We're going to be uh, taught by someone who has spent time with Jesus, and he is excellent at introducing us to a deeper walk with him, and that's what we're hoping for. All right, guys, uh, who wants to say our closing prayer? I will. Go ahead, Monty. Thank you so much. Dear glorious Father of mercy and grace, thank you once again for bringing this study group together. Your word is all we need in our lives, and, and we also pray for the well-being of those who can't be here, and I pray that you bestow them with comfort and healing, dear Lord. Lord Jesus, your name is like no other. Amen.